and welcome to Fast Forward, conversations about living in the future. I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com. We are still at the CES show floor, and I'm here with Leah Gilliam, the VP of Strategy and Innovation at Girls Who Code. Uh, it's a very important conversation we're going to have. We're going to talk about diversity, we're going to talk about the role of women in the history of computing and the future of computing and a lot of other things. Thanks so much for taking time to talk to me. Sure, thanks for having me. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, the, part of the reason we're having this conversation now is because of the movie release of Hidden Figures. Mm -hmm. um, amazing story. And as I'm, I'm thinking about it, one of the first times we've seen, I mean, we've seen the role of women as computers, uh, human computers, right. throughout history. Uh, there have been a couple of roles, there's been a couple of history books, but mm -hmm. this is the first movie I've, I can think of that really casts them as central characters, yeah. makes them human, and really shows not only what they can do, right. but then how it affected their lives. Right. Yeah, several years ago there was a documentary that was about the, the human computers behind the ENIAC. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's a little bit, like for the geeky set, that's yeah. a little bit more more known, but really specifically the kind of colored computers, the story of the African-American women who were doing the computing and who were replaced by machines, like all of that is totally, totally new. And I was, I was like, I'm, I'm always happy to learn something new. And so I was like, wow, I didn't quite know all those details. I'm really glad the story came out and we all have a chance to really kind of dig into it. Yeah, I don't think anybody knows all those details. It's an unknown uh, history in a lot of ways. and. Um, even the fact that their computing was something that was done by humans, mm -hmm. that computers then took over. Yeah. Um, we've talked about that a lot, that in the course of these technological changes, artificial intelligence, automation, yeah. we are losing a lot of jobs. Yeah. Um, and this was the first wave of that impact. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that's so interesting about the film as well is um, the Dorothy Vaughn character who Octavia Spencer portrays. She has that moment where you know she, she's about to get replaced and she's sort of like, what's this thing Fortran? She's sneaking in the room. Mm -hmm. She's like teaching herself you know, Fortran. She's, she has that moment that we've all had where we're like, wait, what's the new thing? What are we supposed to be figuring out now? Yeah. And she just like inserts herself into the situation. And I think, you know, Sometimes we get a little bit confused about what the conversation is about, and part of it is about what is our relationship to mm -hmm. new technological innovations. And it's, and it's constantly changing. Totally. So uh, that was then, yeah. um, and we talked about it a little bit before we started recording, that you know, there was a point in time when women were the primary computing resource for humanity, and now we've gotten to a point where uh, young women are not pursuing careers in the computer sciences, in engineering. How did that happen? Yeah, it's so interesting and it's cool to talk about this stuff um, at a place like CES because when it comes to women in computer science, the history of the personal computer is really key. And so like, you know, like a lot of geeks were sort of aware of those early, you know, Apple ads from 1980, but you go back and you kind of look at it, the ad for the Apple II, there's a woman who's in the kitchen and her husband's like sitting there, you know, like geeking out at the at the table. Um, there are all of these ads that were very specifically, you know, targeting doing this kind of work to men, to boys, and that really has a big impact on, you know, who parents encourage to do something, like what ideas you have about what it is you might be doing as you grow up. And, you know, there were a lot of us who like you know, sort of self-taught or maybe you did some CS in school and then you get in there and you're just like, wait, isn't this the first day of class? How do all these people know what they're doing? And I like, don't. And part of it is just like that whole history of PCs being targeted to men and boys and people just like tinkering and kind of getting used to taking those things apart um, as, as kids. So, you know, like those cultural messages, the actual marketing of the technology had a lot to do with it. And then real, you know, institutional systemic barriers, like all of the like the laws and real injustices that also got in the, got in the way too. Yeah, I mean, PC Magazine is a 30-year-old brand, mm -hmm. and if you go back into the early days and you look at how computers were being marketed, and you yep. look at the advertisements yep. that ran in our on our pages, and you can yep. go on Google Books and find all of those, yeah. it's extraordinary. Yeah. Like you have, you know, and very much this idea of replacing the secretary mm -hmm. and they'll have a picture mm -hmm. of a woman and yep. say, "This yep. computer is better than her." Right. And it's right. very uh, it's very on the nose, and right. it, and you know we've come a long way but evidently not far enough. And it's interesting, I mean, obviously computers aren't the only technology that has that history. If you go back and you look at motion picture production, so you had all of those women who are really significantly editing, um, which we know now we recognize as a really creative, um, you know, kind of technical role. Then it was like, oh, it was seen as being really close to sewing. Mm -hmm. So that might be a, woman, a job that you would give to a woman. Mm -hmm. So it just like permeates all of the stuff that we're, that we, all of the technology fields that are out there. 
So Girls Who Code, obviously trying to change that. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about the organization. For those of us that don't know, we've covered it a bunch of times on PC Mag, but. Yeah. Yeah, so Girls Who Code, it will be five years strong this year. We're super excited about that. Um, we have two after-school programs. Both of them are free. One is a summer immersion program, seven weeks. We embed girls in 13 markets across the, across the United States. They're working in places like Facebook and Twitter at IBM. Um, we really see this as just an introduction, kind of getting them, we're super acquainted with computational thinking, getting to understand how computers work, and then also really um, kind of working with one another and getting the kind of basic kind of problem solving and then working on their own projects. So that's kind of our like, that's our kind of like lab where we where we do real, we see girls making really great, interesting things. And what age groups do you target? And this is, this is 11th and 12th grade. And then that was our first program. And then from that, there was this real kind of outcry of people who wanted to see, you know, wanted, they were like, well, listen, if you don't live in a major kind of city where tech, where tech is a big industry, like, how do we bring the, this great program to our daughters, to our, you know, to our girls? And that's how our after school programs brought it up. So now we have after school clubs in 50 states across the United States between our summer immersion program and our after school clubs. Um, by the end of the 2017 school year, we, we really hope to have worked with 40,000 girls. So we're really working hard to close that gender gap um, and make sure that girls understand that they can be computer scientists. Like, this is the kind of stuff that they can do. And it's not like lone, dark, scary dude basement. It's like other people who look like them. It's like solving problem. It's like, it's a really unique and diverse kind of field. So it's, it's been, it's, it's awesome. So you guys are doing what you can do. Where, uh, what else needs to happen? I mean, I, I would always, I would look to the educational system and say, mm -hmm. how we're going about this is not working. Yep. So we need to make some changes there. Do you have any suggestions for how that? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely when you think about education, the educational system, we see that computer science is really only taught as something where you can get any kind of math or science credit in about 28 states, right? So there's a huge problem. Um, and the CS for All movement is really about bringing computer science into the day-to-day -day classroom and thinking about doing that in a really inclusive and kind of interesting way. Um, so definitely educational systems and policies are huge. We want to see computer computer science as something that's existing in the classroom. But we also know that um, it's really about understanding how technology underpins the whole workforce and having people who are in leadership positions, people who are in fields outside of technology really think differently about how they're solving their problems. Like who are the people they're inviting in? What are the kind of skills or capabilities that they're rewarding when they're looking at a CV? Are they looking for someone who sort of came up and looks like them? Like, so we want to make sure that people aren't just thinking about education, but they're thinking about policy, they're thinking about access, they're thinking about their own individual role in changing the, the situation as well. I think that's a really good point because when most people think about uh, computer education, computer science, they think, okay, we're going to teach everybody to program. Yeah. We're going to tell the kids how to program and once they know how to program, they're all going to graduate and they'll be able to work at Facebook yeah. or they'll be able to build apps. Yeah. And I think there's something more fundamental to computer science where programming languages are less important than understanding how programs are how programs are built and how all of these things are connected. Yeah, completely. And that's, I mean, that's the kind of underlying tenet of our work at Girls Who Code, even though code is in the is in the title and it's obviously a big draw. We really focus on what those fundamental ideas are. So whether a girl wants to build a, ro uh, you know, a website or like think about a robot, like whatever it is they're working on, just to make sure that they understand it's like it's a basic language. Like we give them kind of, we talk, we created literacy. this idea of the core four. It's totally, it's about illiteracy, you know, func like conditionals, you know, functions, like we create a kind of a basic vocabulary for them and really give them that to, to move forward and then make sure they understand that whatever it is they're doing now is going to look completely different in a year. Um, and we want them to just have the confidence to know like, yeah, 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 I get it. I know what object-oriented programming is. I can, I can, yeah, I can figure it out from here. Um, and it's that kind of like leg up of inspiring them, but also, you know, having them work with other women, have that sense of kind of sisterhood, of like community, um, having, you know, professionals come in so they can get a sense of what it's like in the, in the real world. Um, those kind of, that kind of combination of stuff is what we find really works. And it's also what all the research sort of tells you is that, you have to show people that it's relevant. You have to show people that um, it's interesting, particularly if you're going to, you know, bring in outside groups who've been historically underrepresented. 
In terms of, so that's the educational component to it. In terms of the private sector, yeah. Girls of Code sounds like, seems like you've got a lot of great corporate partners that you've been, worked with. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've had, we've, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, it's like, what is the role of in private sector? I mean, this is, what, what do they have to do? Right, and this is exactly where we are. When you, you know, when you make that kind of movement from something that has, you know, has early adopters, it has those fans, but we, you know, we're trying to create solutions that fit the size of the problem. So our real focus right now is in our after school clubs. And that means really having people in communities feel as if they can facilitate and inspire young women to get into computer science, to understand computational literacy. So as a team um, and as an organization, we've really worked to kind of redesign our curriculum so anyone who wants to facilitate a club can do that. So you're not actually, if you're facilitating after school club, it's a commitment of two hours a week, but you are not tech, you don't have to completely understand computer science, you don't have to teach girls programming, you know, there's so many resources out there that do that really well, but you have to inspire girls, you have to sort of facilitate the project, you have to help them understand the relevance and the importance, because, you know, that's actually the key thing, that's the thing that, like, we really need people to do, um, and we're hoping that this is really going to help us, you know, really expand our clubs program and expand that footprint, so our goal is, you know, 50 states, we started out with about... 400 plus clubs at the end of 2016. Oh no, let's see, at the end of 2015. And then we're now expanding. We're trying to get to 1,500 clubs um, you know, by February, 4,000 4, um, at, the, at, the, at the end of this school year. And just to try to really get as many people as possible inspired to teach girls to code, to facilitate the clubs, and to make it something that is you know, that can easily be picked up by people, whether you're super, super techie or whether you're just open to inspiring girls and, you know, working with other people in your community. So five years in, yeah. 40,000 girls that that's where we hope to you've be. worked with? Yeah, that's where we hope to be. How do you, um, do you have success stories? Like, how does this affect um, their confidence, yeah. the choices that they make, the schools they go to? Yeah, no, we're, it's, it's, it's so interesting. I read, um, I read an article the other day that was from, you know, got, kind of got sent around the Girls Who Code office that was about a University of Pennsylvania student who had just had, her, had an idea patented. And it was interesting to see that the kind of, that really substantial early role of Girls Who Code in her work. I mean, obviously this was someone who was already interested and sort of acclimated to these ideas, but in 2014, she was in the summer immersion program, um, embedded in Goldman Sachs. Um, right around the time of the Sandy Hook massacre, she was really thinking like, wait, how can, like, how can I make sure that this doesn't happen to other kids? And so now, lo and behold, years later, she's sort of taken that idea. She's gotten involved in hackathons, you know, built by girls. It's a whole kind of movement. It helps take ideas and um, kind of scale them and disperse them. Um, and now she's studying engineering at, at University of Pennsylvania. And that's exactly where we want to be. We want to be that kind of kernel, that moment that girls encounter in middle school or in high school um, that gives them that kind of spark uh, to keep going forward. So whether it's a kind of a great success story like that, or it's some of the some of the research that we're beginning to pull from our programs now, in which we're seeing that girls who, whether they you know go on to become computer science majors, or whether it, we just sort of turn this light on and help them understand like, oh, this is totally something that I could do. And this relates to the, wor the kind of work that I'm doing in school. This is this is not a skill that I thought I had, but it's actually something that I'm interested in. So we're really seeing that you know, over 90% of the girls who are coming out of our summer immersion program are saying, you know, we have an intention to major minor in CS. We're seeing that in our after school clubs, over 65% of the girls are saying, yeah, you know, because of this experience with Girls Who Code, I'm just much more interested in this stuff and much more likely to pursue it. And, and that's the kind of evidence that, you know, that we need. And then we're just now, you know, starting to really look at the longitudinal piece. So what happens five years for a after a program? Mm -hmm. Are girls still, you know, intent on doing this work? You know, what are the kinds of hiccups and pitfalls that might befall them, you know, along the way? But right now, we, you know, we're seeing really strong results. We see girls who are studying computer science in top schools. Um, we see girls who are, um, who are engaged in this work and whether they're going on to specifically do computer science. I mean, we know that the technology is everywhere and, like, like whether they major in CS or not, like having that 
strong foundation, yeah, is this going to be applicable? So we're always sort of like, you know, the goal in some ways is to like give people that confidence and that really that kind of depth so that they have that sense of what computer science looks like, but then to encourage them to just use it um, in relevant ways where whatever they may, they may do next. You're also very close to the point where those girls that have worked through the program are now women right. and may become mentors yep. and then push, circle that, uh, that knowledge back around. Like Teach for America, yep. part of the reason that's so successful is because you never really leave Teach for America. Right. You, you sign up, you believe in the, the, the vision, and then you contribute back over the course of your career. Right. And, uh, yeah, and that was one of the things that was really interesting to me in coming to Girls Who Code is that they were thinking about these issues of diversity and equity and inclusion, you know, as innovation problems. Like, how can we think about not only, you know, what the makeup of a team does to impact what kind of products are made, but then what can we as an organization do to really impact these issues at scale? So one of the first things my team did is we designed, you know, like a little closed social network for girls so that they could connect to one another, just sort of trying to think about what does it mean to design our values, you know, of, of sisterhood, of, um, you know, kind of career and role models into a few products to really help, you know, support girls as they move, as they move forward. And one of, one of those pieces really is that, like, call out to have girls be able to find other girls. And um, we know um, that that when you kind of get out in the world, girls are more likely to ask someone they know if they need help. Um, so we wanted to be begin to really build in some support mechanisms that they could take with them going forward. So we, I mean, we've talked about, you've talked about diversity in terms of fairness, mm -hmm. in terms of social justice, um, but there's also a very real economic <laughs> issue where that is costing businesses and countries in the country mm -hmm. money yeah. and, and, and growth because we don't have enough talent for all the jobs that we need. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really clear. And, you know, for me personally, this has always been, you know, something I've, that I've thought was so important. And then just when you sort of look at the sort of like the, the products that are kind of littered with these, with, you know, problems and sort of like, you know, built in issues, like ways that, you know, we may be kind of programming all kinds of biases and inconsistencies into our future tools. We also really see that this is a huge issue. You know, we need diverse teams to be able to think through these kinds of issues. So, you know, the heart valve, there are all these kind of great examples that are coming to light now, um, where it sort of shows like the, you know, very, the lack of diversity um, of a team created a product that really only fit a small sliver of the population. So, no one on the team. Because they're you know, only subjects. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They're only subjects. The whole team. You know, everyone. You know, was a male, and they thought, oh well, you know, we'll we'll create airbags so that they fit the average male body. Not thinking about women. Not thinking about children. Um, so yeah, this becomes really real in terms of lives lost, but also in terms of the economic impact. Right. What happens when such a huge popu part of our population just isn't contributing to the ideas and the you know kind of products and things that are out in the world? So let's talk, let's talk about, uh, I have two more questions. One, what it, when you look at the technological landscape, mm -hmm. what uh, scares you, frightens you, makes you most concerned um, across all industries? Yeah. I mean, I, th I, I think because I spent a couple years like uh, working at Mozilla and sort of really so Google. advocating, Google advocating, for the, more than anything advocating else. for the open, <laughs> open web, I think one thing that scares me is just this way in which we're so willing to give away our personal information and and that lack of privacy that's out there. I think it's, it's one of these areas, like when I think about Girls Who Code and I think about like underrepresented groups getting more access to technology, I think like, yeah, we need different people thinking through these issues because these are really serious. And, and so that's a huge thing, I think. Like privacy is huge. How you um, how you interact with technology is huge. I, mean, I also think like machine learning is like fascinating. Like I can geek out about that, but I also it's scared. You know, like yeah. it scares me. And I don't want to sound like a these total are, you know technical. These are exactly but it's, like, the things we talk about. These are the thing like you you know. I like I want people. I want like real people like thinking through these issues and thinking about the repercussions. I mean. It, it, it's a fair point. And at the same time, when you have a product like Alexa, yeah. which provides so much utility, yep. so easy to use, right. and um, you know, it, its pull is almost irresistible. Yeah. It's like Facebook. Like yeah. You, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. If you could say you don't like Facebook, but yeah. if, you, if, you, if you're not on Facebook, like, you can't talk to your mom every no, week. That's true. And you can't, see, you, know, you can't see your sister's yep. baby pictures. Yep. And um, so like, how do you, like, what do you do with something like Alexa? Do you expect the company to protect you and hope for that? Um, no. 
I don't think you can ever. <laughs> I don't think you can ever expect a, a company to protect you. Um, but, but our, our government uh, will protect us. Yeah, yeah, no, I think the government will be totally totally fine. Yeah, I think yeah, it's we'll going be good. really we'll be well. Yeah, so like, far. I think we're done. No, I. I mean, I think for sure this is why. Um, you know, for me as someone who like came at all this through a kind of creative path, like I started out in art and then I just kept getting more techie as I saw like the kind of cool stuff you could do with code. Um, I think it's really about making sure that there are enough opportunities out there, there are enough like there, there is a way for people to actually understand what's happening and think around the system. So, like, can can we make sure that girls understand how to program, you know, and and think through something like Alexa? Like, what like what does that mean to actually, you know, think about this in a little bit of a subversive way to have people make you know art or join you know or join teams and be a part of you know, sort of have the comfort and the interest to be a part of the kinds of the kinds of products that are being developed. And there are tool makers like Mozilla that are providing the tools yep. to sort of help fight back, defend your privacy, defend your personal information, to educate people. Yeah. We had Chris Lawrence on just a couple of weeks ago. Right, 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 my old and, boss. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. and went to the glass room and yeah. saw the exhibits. Yep. And, and the beautiful thing about those art exhibits is they really made this digital question of digital privacy yep. concrete yep. and real yep. and, and brought it home. And it was very effective. Yeah, I mean, I think that's like that. One thing I think was interesting to me about coming to Girls Who Code was for was personally sort of thinking differently about what kind of education you want to give people. Um, having them having just this moment where I thought, yeah, you know, like. Yes, we want to fight for the open web. These issues are really important, but we also want girls to be able to do everything, and we want girls to be everywhere. So, like, we want them learning inside of Facebook. Like, I want that to be one of their first experiences of learning how to code, so they can see like this is, you know, what these companies look like. This is what it would be like to work at IBM. So they get a sense of like where it is they want to be, and that's where this issue of scale becomes really important. Like, you want to be. You want to try and really educate as many different girls as possible so that they take whatever it is that is their passion that they're interested in. And, you know, I'm not naive. I don't think it's all going to be for good, right? But they take those ideas, they get out there, and they, like, conquer the kinds of, the kinds of problems that they, that they think are worthwhile. So on the flip side, what are you most excited about? And it can be a technology, a movement, but what about the, the world we're, we're moving into that you're genuinely excited about? Yeah, I don't, I mean... I'm, I'm too much of a, a like cynic to get super mm. <laughs> excited about it, stuff. It could be something really silly. Yeah, it could be yeah, a, yeah. virtual reality headsets. Yeah, it could yeah, be yeah. anything you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do have to say that I love seeing people like walking around with the VR headsets. Really? You know, it's clunky. It doesn't, you know, like it's, it's a little embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I, I, that surprised me a little bit. I didn't think like it would get the kind of uptake. I think we can argue about whether it's really gotten some big uptake, yeah. but still, like I, you know, like everyone on my flight coming over had like their cardboard headset, sat down with it. Like I don't know if they knew what it, what they were doing, but they sort of like picked it up and were willing to, to kind of like on. go that way. They strapped on. So I thought that I thought that was pretty. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. It's, I mean, we've been testing them for a while, yeah. so we're a little uh, we're a little. Uh, uh, ahead of the curve, and we are live at CES here, yeah. so we've got a lot of people around us, people in front of the camera, uh, people all over the place. So, uh, uh, but yeah, so we've been testing them for a while, so I, my um, discovery point happened a long time ago, yeah. but it is amazing how many people put on the headset and their mouth opens, yep. and then it just doesn't close. Yep. It just doesn't close until uh, yeah. they, you know, they've gone through the thing, yeah. and it's, um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, no, it's cool, and I mean, I was one of those people who was just like, I mean, I, I thought this past summer with Pokemon Go was awesome. Yeah. I just loved seeing people embrace this technology that it's not like we haven't known about it for a while. Yeah, but just technologically like that, yeah, not that sophisticated. Of course not, not at all. But just like, great idea, this, this, this sort of, you know, interesting way that is like not, I mean, the, like game design wise, not the most like sophisticated mechanic, right? But just like, I love seeing people out there. I love like, having to like, you know, show my mom like this is this is this is what everyone's doing. Like I love just like that it permeated component. that way. Finally, yeah. That first yeah, night yeah, yeah. it was like the first yeah. or second night it was available. Yep. I went out and uh, went for a walk after dinner, which I never do. Uh, and I knew, could see a couple of people and yeah. I was like I knew what they were doing. Yeah. They're doing the same thing I was doing, yeah. which is hunting. Right. Went down to the water in Jersey City and there were crowds 
of 75, 100 kids, yep. and all, all ages, yep. all yep. sitting around a, tri a triumphant of totally. like lures set mm -hmm. just a, far enough apart that you could you could fish in multiple yeah. areas. Yeah. And everybody was talking. Mm -hmm. Everybody was talking to each other, looking yeah. at their phones. Yeah. Did you find anything? What would you get? Like. And nobody knew each other. No. And there no. were there was tribalism over yeah. the different. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was really extraordinary. Yeah. And then three months later, gone. Gone. Just, it was Dead. a wave that yes, hit and totally. wiped out. Yep. Fascinating. Totally. No, I'm with you. I, I loved that moment. I was like, this is amazing. And then just like, yeah, I mean, I, don't, I, I like that you say three months. I think you're right. It was, about, it was about three months. And then it was just like, no, were my nieces and nephews going to take a walk with me? No, they were like, no, we're not taking a walk and doing Pokemon Go. It was dead. It was yeah. over. No added value. Yeah. Like they, kept, they didn't keep adding value to it. And then you just yeah. got wiped out. So uh, let's... Uh, Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, yeah. If people are interested in Girls Who Code, they want to help out, they want to learn more about it, how, how do they find you online? They go to girlswhocode.com, they look up their area, they see like, is there a club there? Can I start my own? That's a huge part. Um, we're super excited about our five-year anniversary. You can give us money there. Um, but for anyone watching the show, like technically, like savvy, interested, you want to inspire the next generation, like, Start a club, find out a way to mentor someone. There, are, if, not, if not Girls Who Code, there's so many other people out there that are really thinking specifically about how to change this issue, so. Fantastic, thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, this is good. Appreciate it. Thank you. This has been Fast Forward with Dan Costa. Thanks so much for joining us. We're gonna have more conversations about living in the future very, very soon. I'll see you in the future.